Thank you, choir and orchestra. If you have your Bible with you this morning, and you will, turn to the book of Matthew, the sixth chapter. And in this wonderful season of eating, today I'm preaching on fasting. So if you will, turn to the book of Matthew, the 16th chapter, beginning in verse number 16. Matthew chapter 6, verse 16. Would you stand, please, for the reading of God's Word? Moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear to men to be fasting. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, so that you do not appear to men to be fasting, but to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time we have together. And Lord, as the word leads us into your presence this day, Lord, I pray, Father, your word will be manifested here today, Lord. I pray today, Lord, that we'll receive everything that you have for us this day, Lord. And I ask you today, Lord, to be glorified in this place, exalted high and lifted up, And Lord, we ask you even now, come Lord Jesus, that Jesus today, you may be the one we look to, the author and the finisher of our faith, for it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. I'm preaching on this subject today, fasting, biblical fasting. What is biblical fasting? Well, when you mention the word fasting to the Hebrew, to the Jew, to who Jesus was talking to here, they immediately would point back into the Old Testament and recognize that in Leviticus, the 23rd chapter, at the Day of Atonement, the high priest would fast. And the Word of God says in Leviticus 23 and 27 that the high priest would afflict his soul. He would be afflicted to the point of fasting for the nation, praying that God would forgive the sins of that nation for one year. And as the high priest prayed and fasted, God would come and remove that sin for a year or cover that sin for a year, pointing to the Lord Jesus Christ, our ultimate high priest, who would once and for all pay the penalty of our sin, and we would be redeemed. So the Jews knew very much about fasting. If you were a Hebrew child, you had been taught to fast. If you were someone who lived in Israel, you knew what the biblical terms of fasting were. It's amazing today that in our Christian churches, when we talk about fasting, people have never heard sermons on fasting. People have never been taught about what real fasting, biblical fasting, is all about. But you'll notice what Jesus said as he begins in verse number 16. It's not if you fast, but when you fast. Notice the words are complete. When you fast, Jesus talking to believers, assuming they know they were called to fast. The benefits for us fasting are enormous. Biblical fasting is involves prayer and intense supplication with God. And I believe if you'll notice what I've been preaching in the last few weeks, there is emphasis on what Jesus talked about in the characteristics of the disciples by noticing he put the same emphasis on giving, praying, and fasting. Jesus looked at all three of these areas and what we've been talking about in the last few weeks on the Sermon on the Mount about the fact that Jesus is pointing to our character of who we are as his disciples. And Jesus was always protecting his disciples from the tendency towards self-righteousness. Jesus did not want us to be disciples who stumble in public demonstrations. I believe the way we carry ourselves, the way we act in this world, reflects who we serve. It reflects who we walk with. It's a direct picture of our walk with Christ and that we are His disciples. Jesus called His disciples in these ways of giving, praying, and fasting to understand that we were not to do this in the ideal of getting the attention of man. 
but that we would draw attention of our Father which is in heaven. So if you'll notice as you go through the word with me this morning, I've given you some notes today concerning fasting. And the first thing I want you to notice in verse number 16, that Jesus pointed out something, that Jesus pointed out the hypocritical fasting. He took notice of it. If you'll know this, he said, hypocritical fasting is wrong. You might want to underline that in your Bible because this is what Jesus was teaching concerning fasting. He was saying this, fasting is not for the purpose of being noticed. Jesus constantly told his disciples they were not to be noticed by man, but to receive the attention of their Father, which is in heaven. But the Sadducees and the Pharisees would walk around with long, drawn faces, letting everybody know they were fasting because they wanted them to think they were spiritual. Church, it's not whether or not people think you're spiritual. It's whether or not God knows you're a spiritual person. And so the word here pointed to the fact That Jesus was saying, don't be like the hypocrites who fast. Who fast in this purpose. Fasting is not to get God to change his mind. I've heard people say, well, I'm going to fast and hope that God will change his mind on a certain situation I'm in. What have we learned in giving and praying and fasting? That we don't change the mind of God, but God changes us. Think about this this morning, church. The Word of God says God is the same. Yesterday, today, and forevermore. So how are you going to change his mind? If God never changes, and God is perfect, and God is omnificent, and God knows exactly what is right for our will, and God has a purpose for our life, and God has a place for us to serve, and God has pointed these things out in his word, how would we ever change his mind? Maybe it's time as disciples that we learn that following Jesus Christ, when it comes to giving and praying and fasting, is about how God changes us, and how we begin to see his kingdom work in us, and not what the world things and how really we get close to him by understanding his principles and his teaching from the very standpoint of he was not getting the attention of men but that we would notice the change in our life through what God does in our life you'll also notice this fasting does not make you more acceptable to God that is not what Jesus was teaching here he was never teaching his disciples a work work place uh, way of living. Let me, let me tell you something, church, that would be wrong in that teaching there. If Jesus pointed to fasting as being more acceptable to God, then what we would have is that we would constantly be finding ways to work to get the pleasing applause of heaven by our works and not by faith. And so never did Jesus teach us that fasting or giving or praying made us more acceptable. He taught us that these were things that disciples would do because of their intimate relationship with Christ. So think about this this morning. As Jesus warned them, he warned them not to defigure themselves. He warned them about their appearance before men, that they were not to seek the applause of men, but to have an encounter with God and to be recognized by God, not man. Fasting is valuable to believers, and the religious people were making a show and a contest. Who fasted the most? Who was the best faster. Who got the most attention of the people when they fasted? That is not what Jesus taught or preached at all. You see, church, fasting is not a show, it's not a contest, and it's not a movement. Fasting is a personal time with Jesus with a purpose. Fasting is a purposeful time with Jesus that we follow what he taught us, and notice what Jesus said, when you fast. Christians, I'll tell you, fasting is very much biblical, a mandate of Jesus Christ, and it's a place where we draw close to God in understanding some things about our life. Now, here they are. I want you to note a second in your notes this morning, the purpose of biblical fasting. And maybe this will help a lot of people as you really learn what biblical fasting is. First of all, let me say some things about biblical fasting. Biblical fasting is a time to prepare for God's call. 
Now, church, I will tell you this this morning. I really believe if people would ask God in prayer and fasting what God's real desire for their life would be, I believe you'd find a clear connection of what God wants you to do. I've had many years of preaching and teaching the Word of God and being a pastor, and people come to me and say, Pastor, what do you think God wants me to do? Here's a clue for you. I have no idea. God hasn't included me on anything of that manner at all. You know why? Because it's a personal relationship between you and the Lord. Because God wants to reveal himself to you. God wants you to see what he wants for your life and his perfect plan and his perfect call. And let me tell you what happens in that. You see, when you get under the call and mandate of God, self-discipline begins to put a, a, a place in your life and spiritual priorities begin to move to the front. And so you see and understand that when Jesus was on the mountaintop with these men, part of their training and teaching was to understand that in fasting, they were going to learn about their call. They were going to learn about what God had placed in their life and what God wanted them to do. And church, I would tell you, if you're in that place this morning where you say, what is it really God wants me to do? And what's God's will for my life? Separate yourself. Pray and fast and ask God, what is it you will have me do? And I'll tell you this, I believe that God will be very clear with you. I believe that God will be very honest with you. And listen to this. I believe that God will reveal his call into your life so you'll understand that purpose. And let me tell you why this is important. And, and I could stay on this all day, but here's the truth. If I call you and ask you to do something, you're probably going to do it because the preacher asked you or you feel guilty or whatever. But you're not going to have a deep conviction about doing that under the mandate of God. You see, when God calls you to do something, how are you going to say no? When God calls you to do something, how purposeful it is and how rewarding it is to know your Father has chosen you to do something that is so kingdom-minded on this earth. And so when you come to biblical practices of what God's called us to and the purpose of it, think about this. God would love to reveal His will to our life, but you know what it's going to take? Sometimes in our life, prayer and fasting so that we separate from all the influence of the world so that we come under the influence of God and we really learn what God has for us. Here's another purpose for this. Another purpose for biblical fasting is cleansing from impurities. Now church, there's many times in Christian's life, and you know this to be true, when God sets you free, you're free indeed. But there's nothing more the enemy would love to do is to yoke you up into something of your past that you've been forgiven from or set free from. And so many Christians struggle with many different things in this world. And I'll tell you something, there are some impurities, some things that can go through our life that there's nothing that would cleanse it or go out of our life quicker than prayer and fasting. And Jesus taught us this in the aspect of there can be bondage in the life life of Christians. And Jesus was about to send these men from the top of this mountain down into the cities of Galilee, knowing there would be many who would be in the bondage of sin and the impurities of life. And so this is what he would talk about. He would talk about their presentation before God and knowing that we're clean and holy and pure and have a repentant heart that we keep clean before God. And sometimes church, I want to tell you this. Many times I've counseled with Christians who've come and said, you know what? I know I'm saved. I know I'm born again. I've been baptized. I'm a believer. I follow Christ. I live uh, as a church member in the church, and I, I know these things that God has for me, but I'm struggling in an area, and I'm struggling with something in my life. It could be alcohol. It could be drugs. It could be all forms of things that are impure in this world, and a lot of times in our life, you know what I'll, I'll say to them every single time? Have you prayed? Yes, we prayed about it, Pastor. Well, what do you think I should do? Fast. Separate yourself from anything in this world where you can hear God. And I'll tell you something. No one can destroy the yoke of bondage like God can. And anything that's under the blood of Jesus is a done deal. And so when those impurities or those ungodly thoughts or something that comes into our life and you're battling and you're struggling with, one of the best things a Christian can do is pray and fast and know God will set you free from that junk in this world. God has not called you to be tied up in the junk of this world. He sets you free. And whom the Son sets free is free indeed. And so God has given you the release from that through the power of His Word. And through the power of His Word, we learn what biblical fasting is. 
Another reason is this. Another purpose for biblical fasting is to equip us for real battle or real spiritual warfare. Now, let me take you to two places in the word that best describes this. First of all, you'll find in the book of Matthew chapter 4 that the Lord Jesus Christ went into the wilderness, prayed and fasted for 40 days, knowing he was about to face the ultimate of temptations from the evil one who Satan had in a head face-to-face contest, conflict, whatever you want to call it, but a battle in the wilderness over every temptation we could ever face. Listen to me. Don't sit there and think you're going through a temptation God doesn't know how to deliver you from. Jesus has already fought that battle. And what did he teach us in that battle? He taught us how to separate ourselves in prayer and fasting in such a way that the enemy could have no stronghold over you. And there are real battles. There are real warfares that take place. There are people sitting here today in these pews who are in massive battles in their life. And I would tell you without blinking an eye that one of the things God may be calling you to do right now is fast. One of the things that God may be asking you to do is separate yourself so that in this warfare and in this battle and in all the things that the struggles you may go through, that you may clearly see, hear, and know God. Biblical fasting helps us in these ways, and it helps us in spiritual warfare. And I know this from this standpoint. In Matthew, the 17th chapter, The Word of God says Jesus is on the mountaintop, and there he's taken a few of his disciples, and as he's on the mountaintop, he is transfigured, and standing on that mountaintop with him is Moses and Elijah. Now, church, I want to tell you something. There is a lot to be said about mountaintop experiences. That was a good place to be, and according to what Peter said, it is good for us to be here. And while we all thrive, our love, our want to be on the mountaintop, there was a real battle going on in the valley. The Word of God says that a man brought his demonic son to the disciples and they prayed, but they could not get the demon cast out of the boy. And when Jesus was asked why they could not do this, he made the simple reply, and you might want to underline this in your Bible, that this kind goes not out but by prayer and fasting according to Matthew 17, 21. So let me tell you what it means. It means that sometimes in our life we could be struggling with something like forgiveness, struggling with something like our marriages, struggling with something like finances, struggling in a job move, struggling in something God uh, may be bringing into our world or something that may be going on in our world. Listen to me, church. Why would we ever make major decisions in our life without seeking the will of God and knowing what God's plan is for us, that God would be clear and purposeful and we would know this is exactly what my Father wants me to do. You see, the Word of God teaches us this, church, and and these can be real struggles in our life. Struggles where we we have a struggle of somebody who's done us wrong and how do I take the right approach of forgiving them and what do I do in that manner? What do I do when I've got people in my family who are lost and need Jesus? Man, I may pray and fast for them. What do I do when I'm going through some times in my life I'm looking for the direction of God and the will of God? I separate myself to the disciplines of God to hear what He has to say. Sometimes in our life, we need to hear this. I would tell people who would come into my office sometimes and they'd come in for marriage counseling and they'd say, Pastor, what do you think we should do? I'd say, pray and fast. And they'd look at me like I was cussing them out. Pray and fast. What is God's will and purpose and plan for your life? And many people do not know. Many people do not see and hear what God really has for them in their life. And the purpose of biblical fasting is simply this, is to know that I am in the will of God and I know how to handle these situations as God has taught me. Why would Jesus tell his disciples to pray, to fast, to give up on that mountaintop if he didn't have the intention of sending them right into those cities with the gospel? 
So think about this this morning, church, and everything that we're talking about. The purpose of biblical fasting can be, I need to know God's will. It can be that I need to be cleansed from something in my own life of impurities. Or it could be from the matter of fact that I am in a major warfare or a battle that's going on in my life. And I need to know God's will and purpose and plan for what he has for me. I will tell you this. Never make major decisions. In your life until you have prayed thoroughly and fasted before God of what his will is. Because I'll tell you this, there's no way he can lead you wrong. There is no way God can lead you wrong. And I've seen people make major moves in their life, major moves in their family, major moves in their their world and things that they've done without God's will and without seeking God for what he'd have them to do. And I've seen people move and think, well, I'll just get a church somewhere or I'll just do this. Let me tell you something. God's purpose in the kingdom is so much greater than that. And so church, understand, God's got a plan and a purpose, and the purpose of biblical fasting is so that you will know intimately God's will for your life. Now, here's the biblical fast. Here's the practices of biblical fasting. I think it'd be wrong for me to talk to you about fasting and about what Jesus spoke about here without giving you the idea of what true biblical fasting is. What are the biblical fasts you will read in the Bible? Now, there are probably more, but there are five that have stuck out to me in my life that God has taught me about biblical fasting, and I'm going to give them to you this morning, that you can clearly see in the Scripture, and here they are. Now, there's biblical fasting that, first of all, you may read as a supernatural fast. That occurs in the book of Matthew, the fourth chapter with the Lord Jesus, who separated himself in the wilderness from everyone and prayed and fasted for 40 days. But also understand this, he knew what was about to take place with the colliding of evil and good there. And he knew that he was about to be in a battle of everything that the enemy came against him in. And he prayed and fasted and outstandingly, without a doubt, conquered every temptation of the enemy. I've heard people say, well, God doesn't know what I'm going through and what I'm being tempted with. Are you kidding me? He knows everything about it and has already granted victory by the fact he never yielded to the enemy. A supernatural fast is one you'll read about in chapter 4 of 40 days, separating in prayer and fasting. Another one that you'll read about is in the book of Daniel. It's called a partial fast. In Daniel chapter 1, the Word of God says Daniel at a young age and his friends were set before the king that was in Babylon to be introduced to Babylonian culture and the Babylonian gods. And Daniel and his friends prayed and fasted. And they fasted to a part of only having water and vegetables. And it seems to be a reoccurring theme in Daniel's book. Three times we see Daniel pray and fast at least. There in chapter 9 and 10. And in those times in Daniel's life, he had a constant pattern of Fasting, a partial fast was used sometimes by Daniel to seek the will of God in some favor or some plan that God had for his life. Here's an amazing thing. Daniel prayed and fasted in his late years. He was 86 years old the last time it was recorded he fasted. So some of you may be sitting here and thinking, well, I'm too old to fast or I'm too young to fast. Daniel fasted from the time he was young in his life, a teenage boy, till he was 86 years old at least, fasting and praying before the Lord and God revealed to him the Antichrist. God revealed to him the captivity of the Jews. God revealed to him when they would return back to the city. God revealed to him the favor that he would uh, uh, take in Babylonian captivity. So in that partial fast, Daniel separated himself. So a lot of people say, you know, Pastor, I cannot go days without eating something. Daniel used vegetables and water for 21 days and God blessed him. Let me tell you what he didn't do. He didn't use fasting to lose weight. He used fasting with a biblical principle to seek God's will. 
Now, here's something else you'll know. It's called an absolute fast. The Bible describes in the book of Ezra, the 10th chapter, verse number 6, and in Esther, chapter 4, verse 16, that they called upon the Jews to do an absolute fast of no water or no bread, at least for one day, maybe even up to three, because of this reason. If they had not had, the Jews might have been annihilated off the earth. They prayed for their extension. They prayed. They prayed because Haman had a plan to wipe out the Jews. And Esther prayed and called upon the people of God to get the plan of God to know what to do when this evil attack came and God was clear what's supposed to be done and God saved his people. And so there is a time of absolute fasting that you see in Ezra and Esther that concern the people of God. And I'm going to tell you something. There may, came a t there may come a time when God calls upon his church to go into an absolute time of fasting for our nation also. There's also a private fast. A private fast is what you're going to read that's taking place in verses 17 and 18. It's a place where nobody knows what's going on in your life, where you have not discussed or counseled with anybody else, but you've went into your secret place with God and you've separated from everything in this world and you have prayed and fasted seeking God's will upon something in your life or seeking God's will on knowledge or wisdom or whatever it is God has for you. But here's what Jesus didn't want you to do. Jesus did not want you to go out and promote and get the will of man, but get the recognition of your Father in heaven. And so he called it a private fast here, and it was a place where it's between you and God. And when you walk out of that room, and when you walk out of that time in your life, you'll know you've heard from the Lord. It's a private fast. Then the Word of God talks about a congregational fast. It's used twice in the scriptures in the best way in the book of Joel chapter 2 verses 15 and 16 where Joel called upon the congregation to go into a time of fasting for repentance. A time in which the nation would turn away from evil and idols and repent and get right with God. And I do believe there's some times in our church when we're in revival that there needs to be a congregational fast where repentance brings us closer to God, takes sin out of the camp, and it draws people to come to God's house. There's a time of congregational fasting. But there's also a time of congregational fasting that we find in the book of Acts chapter 13 verse number 2 where the word of God says in Antioch the church was in Antioch the church was fasting and praying and as they did God separated Paul and Barnabas for the great missionary call so there's a time that the church prays and fasts, and we've seen this even in last Sunday that God's calling people right here out of our church to go to the mission field so there's a time when the church prays and fasts together and it goes into a congregational fast where God brings great repentance or where God separates some that are being called to the mission field for the glory of the gospel. So church, notice what Jesus said here. And watch these real close. He said, when you fast, there's a biblical principle and reason that we fast. When you fast, separate that time in your life with you and God. And understand that God's going to work greatly in your life. There may be some reasons today you need to fast. Maybe over a job, maybe in your marriage, maybe with a friend or family member, or maybe somebody you're praying and fasting for to be saved. But know this, there's no way you can go wrong by drawing close to God. You draw close to God, He's going to draw close to you. And so this morning, when you see the biblical principles of fasting, you realize that God has a purpose and a plan in everything he does. And what Jesus was teaching his disciples, there are some times in your life where you're going to need to separate from the influence of the world and get under the influence of God. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for your word. And we've been learning about giving, about praying, and about fasting. And in all three places, you are very much consistent in what you teach us. Not to get the recognition of man, but to get the recognition of God. Not to get the applause of this world, but the applause of heaven. And Father, there may be some here today who are going through spiritual battles. Some here today that are going through some family things. 
Some who need to make major decisions, who need to begin this morning in prayer, and who needs to carry it to fasting in a room where they meet with God. Some here today who've never fasted, never heard a sermon on biblical fasting today that's awoke them to the attention of giving a place of fasting before the Lord. Maybe there's some here today that do not know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, and today they need to give their life to Christ. Maybe some here today that, need to, that want to be under the accountability of a place where they come and worship and need to join here today at Northside, Father. There's many, I pray, that's been praying and seeking the will of God for their life. And so this morning, Father, I pray they'd come forward in a decision to follow Christ. Father, in everything that happens in this place, may it be to your glory. May it honor you. May a time when we're giving or praying or fasting be a time in our life that we've done in our heart before God. What most pleases you that manifests us, that Jesus is seen in our life. We're your disciples. Your ways are higher than our ways. Your thoughts are higher than our thoughts. To God be the glory. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to invite you.